Oh, come on, you know I don't watch that shit. Why not? Too scared. No, no, it's just, what's the point? They're all the same. Some stupid killer stalking some big-breasted girl who can't act who's always running up the stairs when she should be going out the front door. It's insulting. Every October, as the seasons change, the leaves turn color and we don warmer clothes, something else happens for many of us. We also gain a craving not just for warm drinks, but for scary movies. Horror films have continued to fright and delight audiences since the advent of cinema, with some of the earliest silent films being focused on that which evokes fear. Long before being put to film, there were novels that inspired many of the classic cinema characters such as Dracula and the Frankenstein monster that stoked scares in readers and, long before that, tales of monsters and demons were shared and repeated through oral traditions. Throughout our history as a species, we have gravitated towards the grisly, the gruesome, and the grotesque across every media platform that we have invented, from spoken word to video games. We kind of love to be scared, but why? Being scared is a negative emotion. It makes us feel uncomfortable or upset, so why would we be so mystified by the macabre? Today, let's look at the research on why we love horror, both from the perspective of electing to expose ourselves to the eerie for the purpose of enjoyment, and why we might do so as a product of evolutionary psychology to truly understand why we seemingly can't get enough of the creepy. But before we get into scary cinema, what about scary news? It seems so much of the daily news is really just the daily horror, inundating viewers with a deluge of negative information, and research from Ernst Schwab and Winterhoff Spurk, 2008, who studied the kind of emotions that people felt when exposed to nasty news stories, found that anger, sadness, disgust, and fear were the most common amongst them, not enjoyment. And because the news can so often be so miserable, that's why you should add some humor to your news consumption by checking out this video's sponsor, The Morning Brew. The Morning Brew is a free daily newsletter to help you catch up on what's happening both locally and around the world, be it related to finance, politics, culture, etc. Each article on The Morning Brew is written with your time in mind and only take about five minutes to read so you can get your news in pleasant sips rather than hard to swallow gulps of information. The Brew aims to not just inform, but to entertain, and for that reason the articles are written with a small but healthy dose of levity. The Brew offers weekly quizzes so you can check your knowledge of current events, and they even host weekly meme battles that you can submit your own memes to. For your daily cup of piping hot headlines with a spoonful of wit, check out The Morning Brew, linked below, and sign up for their newsletter to become smarter in just five minutes. Designed not with horror, but with humor in mind, and again, absolutely free. It only takes 15 seconds to sign up for, so why not give the newsletter a try to see what The Brew is all about? And now that we've got our hot cup of joe, it's time to cozy up around the digital campfire and talk about the evolution of fear and horror. Fear, for as unpleasant as it may be, is a useful emotion. It helps us determine when to fight, flee, or freeze in reaction to a stimuli, but because fear is an instantaneous response, that often means we react in fear to something that doesn't really warrant it, and that's a product of cognitive heuristics. Various scholars have proposed that humans are predisposed to be afraid of certain things, such as snakes or spiders, but these creatures have the capacity to present a serious threat to human life, particularly in a prehistoric environment with no real ability for medical care. As such, our fear of specific dangers, such as snakes, cause us to react quickly to things that we could reasonably think might be a snake, such as a stick in the grass. Thus, our specific predisposition to be wary against snakes produces an association of something that looks like a snake and causes us to occasionally jump back in fright from nothing more than a harmless inanimate twig. Similarly to snakes, fear of spiders is amongst the most prevalent phobias reported across the human population, with between 3-6% to of people possessing some form of arachnophobia, and about 30% of women and 20% of men reporting anxiety when confronted with a spider. I wake up this morning and I go into the kitchen to make myself a bowl of cereal, and there's a spider on the counter, so I couldn't eat! And then like three hours later, I go to the grocery store to buy some peaches, and when I'm in the produce aisle, I sneeze so hard I fart and a little bit of shit comes out. Despite the prevalence of this fear, only 0.1 to 0.3% of all spider species possess a potentially deadly venom to humans. After all, spiders eat insects or small animals, not humans. There's no reason for a spider to have evolved the capacity to kill something the size of a person or larger, at least outside of Japan. Hey, spider, <laughs> but despite the fact that most spiders don't pose a serious threat to human life, Many people are terrified of anything creepy and crawly that might even just vaguely resemble a spider, and react to it in fear when really it's just a piece of black lint. To understand how common fears influence our heuristics, our immediate reactions to stimuli, 
Omen, Flicked, and Estevies 2001 expose participants to projected images of spiders, snakes, mushrooms, and flowers in various image matrices that contained all nine images of the same type or eight images of the same type with one discrepant image. For example, eight images of flowers and one image of a snake. When all the images matched, all being, let's say, mushrooms for instance, subjects were asked to press a switch in their offhand as quickly as they had determined that the images were of the same subject and to press a switch in their dominant hand as soon as they identified a discrepant image within the matrix. When the images were predominantly of spiders or snakes, it took longer for subjects to recognize the discrepant image of a flower or a mushroom in the matrix, while participants quickly identified the snake or spider in the matrix comprised predominantly of images of flowers or mushrooms. A second experiment varied the size of the matrices, and this trend was the case regardless of the size of the matrix, although reaction time was slower in detecting the non-fear-inducing images in the larger matrix. That is, people very quickly recognized the presence of a snake or a spider in a matrix of flowers or mushrooms, but took longer to locate a flower or a mushroom in a matrix of snakes or spiders. And response time only changed when there were more pictures of spiders or snakes, rather than pictures of mushrooms or flowers. Participants were less likely to make an error and misreport the matrix type via using the left and right-handed switches when there was no distractor image in the matrix, and were the most likely to make a mistake when the matrix was larger and contained a non-fearful distractor image, like a mushroom in a matrix of snakes, indicating that subjects were more likely to make mistakes when looking at a bunch of pictures of animals that induce fear. This was the case even though mushrooms are potentially just as deadly, if not more deadly, in terms of frequency, than are snakes or spiders. Fear, like all emotions, begins in the brain, although it can and does affect the body in a variety of ways, from shaking and sweating to an increased heart rate. So to better understand fear, we should better understand the parts of the brain that process fear, and primarily, that's the amygdala. Oh, amygdala. Oh, amygdala. Oh, shit! A spot! To evidence the role that the amygdala plays on fear, Feinstein et al. 2011 conducted a study with a 44-year-old patient, S.A., who presented with rare bilateral lesions on her amygdala. First, the researchers brought S.A. to an exotic pet store and questioned her about her fear of snakes and spiders. Although she said she was afraid of the animals, when given an opportunity to hold a snake, she agreed and then held it for over three minutes, petting its scales and touching its tongue, perhaps even booping its snoot expressing how cool she thought the experience was and never reporting any level of fear in response to the snake that exceeded two on a 10-point scale. Essay also expressed 15 times over a desire to touch some of the store's more dangerous snakes, even when warned against doing so by the shop owner. When asked why, she said because she was just curious. Next, Essay was brought to the Waverly Hill Sanatorium, considered one of the most haunted places in the world. She was paired with a group of five strangers and elected herself to lead the group through the tour showing no response to the attempts from the supposed monsters present on the tour, and instead actually reached out and tried to touch and interact with the things that were intended to induce fright. She expressed no fear during the event, although she did report that she found the experience exciting and fun. Similarly, when S.A. was shown segments of horror films in the lab, she responded without fear but still reported that she enjoyed the experience. When compared to viewers of the same clips, who did not possess bilateral damage to the amygdala, the difference was really clear. S.A. did not experience fear in response to the same stimuli that induced fear in the average participant. Although this case study can really only provide evidence for one individual, it gives us a good way of understanding the important role of the amygdala on fear, both as it relates to real dangers like venomous snakes and simulated dangers like haunted houses and horror films. And speaking of horror films and fear specifically, we can see amygdalic reactions in fMRI data in response to horror films in Heinrich, Intrader, and Hendler 2012, who exposed subjects to five minutes of either the birds or Halloween while being monitored via fMRI. During viewing, subjects were asked to rate how afraid they were on a scale of one to three. As expected, higher responses of fear increased as both films continued, but subjects generally reported more high levels of fear for longer periods of time while watching the birds than Halloween. Specifically for the birds, subjects tended to widely vacillate between feeling no and low levels of fear, and reports of the highest level of fear were entirely based on the individual participant. While subjects were watching the movie The Birds or Halloween, the max degree of activation in the amygdala during scenes of high conscious fear was significantly higher across subjects than the degree during the non-conscious fear intervals that occur between frightening scenes. While Kynrick et al.'s study illustrates that fear peaks at unique moments of tension, it also builds over time the longer we are exposed to a scary scenario. And thus, to further understand how horror affects the brain, Hudson et al. 2020 
Similarly, used fMRI to study how things like jump scares differ in neurological response from building sensations of fear over the course of exposure to a scary movie. Before the experiment, a separate group of subjects were asked various questions about how often they watch horror films, the feelings that those films elicit, what kind of genre of horror they felt was generally scariest, and how they rated the scariness of a film with its quality. Excitement, anxiety, and being scared were the most common emotions reported in response to horror, rather predictably. Psychological horror was rated as the most scary, followed by films based on real events and then supernatural themes. Further, there was a positive, linear relationship between how scary a film was rated and the perceived quality of that film, such that the scarier, the better. Interestingly, subjects rated films with fewer jump scares, such as The Devil's Backbone, hey, a personal favorite of mine, and The Wailing, both of which contained four jump scares as both higher in quality and more frightening than films like Insidious and The Conjuring 2, both of which contain more than 20 jump scares. Because of the higher number of jump scares, the researchers thus chose to focus their subsequent analysis on those two films, Insidious and The Conjuring 2. Oh, and I know that a lot of the time when some YouTuber mentions a jump scare, it inherently tends to put the viewer on edge, thinking that YouTuber's gonna put a jump scare in the video, and I'm just letting you know up front, there will be no jump scares in this video, except for this one, just to clear the air. <laughs> Subjects were placed in an fMRI imaging machine and watched the entire length of one of the two films, again, Insidious or The Conjuring 2, during which time their dynamic fear, that is, their sustained fear over time, and instantaneous fear in response to jump scares were measured. Mean dynamic fear tended to peak around the same times as did jump scares. In terms of neural activation, jump scare scenes were related to increased activity in numerous regions of the brain, so please bear with me as we describe each one. Increased activation occurred in the anterior cingulate cortex, or ACC, a region associated with attention and decision-making, the middle cingulate cortex associated with pain and fear, the posterior cingulate cortex, memory, the thalamus, alertness, the amygdala, as we know, fear, the parahippocampus, memory, the precentral gyrus, involuntary movement, the superior temporal gyrus, audio processing, the anterior insular cortex, emotions, the middle temporal gyrus, facial recognition, and the lingual gyrus, vision. Sustained fear was much less potent in terms of activation levels and differed in which regions it affected. Specifically, the ACC, the postcingulate gyrus, the lingual gyrus, the superior temporal gyrus, and the precaneus, a complex area related to memory, perception, reactivity to stimuli, and pain response, and the fusiform gyrus, related to facial recognition. Despite these different regional activations to sustained and instantaneous fear, reactions to these films were highly correlated across subjects. There were differences in reactions to the two films, with The Conjuring 2 eliciting intersubject correlations between fear and activation in the left cuneus, visual processing, the bilateral superior parietal lobe, dopaminergic, and in the cerebellum, muscle movement, including in the cerebral lingual, tonsil, and uvula. Additionally, The Conjuring 2 also provoked decreased reaction across subjects in the occipital lobe, a region related to visual processing, as fear increased. In turn, insidious viewers exhibited additional positive fear relationships in the frontal regions, which affect emotions and behaviors, the temporal regions, which affect visual and emotional processing, and the occipital regions, which are again involved in visual processing. There was no negative effect of fear on activation for insidious viewers, as there was for Conjuring 2 viewers. In both films, general levels of dynamic fear resulted in intersubject activation in the middle cingulate cortex, again related to pain and fear, the paracentral lobule, a region associated with um, having to go pee pee, the periaqueductal gray, threat and fear, the thalamus, both the precentral and postcentral gyrus, related to involuntary movement and sensation, and the superior temporal gyrus, language. While only the conjuring 2 produced dynamic decreased reactivity in the middle occipital gyrus, again, language. So, what the hell does all of that mean? It sounds like some commie gobbledygook. To translate these findings out of gobbledygook, Acute fear, that is fear in response to a jump scare, was related to activity in various cortical, limbic, and cerebral regions, all of which have been associated with response to threats. Moreover, sustained fear was related to increased activity in the cortices of the brain associated with audio and visual processing. Thus, when we are placed into an environment where we think something scary might happen, like being in the Balkans in the 90s, our brains are uniquely alert, searching for signs of danger. When we then are faced with something directly frightening, rather than a threatening aura, or an anticipation of fear, <laughs> we experience greater activation in the parts of the brain associated with emotional processing, learning and memory, and behavioral planning. As such, as fear increases, our sensory systems are placed on high alert and by nature of that alertness, facilitate greater attention allowing the viewer to focus intently, attempting to gather evidence and better understand the scenario to protect themselves from potential harm. 
Meanwhile, other areas of the brain, namely the prefrontal gyrus, are also activated, which promote rapid response in reaction to some frightening stimuli, i.e. the literal jump part of the jump scare. Even though there's no real threat of physical harm present when watching a horror film, the brain reacts much in the same way as it would to any other kind of dangerous stimuli, heightening our senses and reflexes while focusing our attention, drawing from our memories of past events and quickly gathering new information to not only be better informed about the current environment, but to learn from that situation in the future and add that information to a useful pool and increase human survivability. In other words, our brains respond to horror much in the same way our ancestors would have responded to coming across a predator or a venomous animal in the wild. As such, horror films activate the same parts of the brain as is exposure to a snake or a spider and causes us to be uniquely alert. Due to this activation, are we actually more drawn towards things that scare us than more neutral things like a flower? Well, usually. You feed me, crab on, feed me now! Are we naturally drawn to that which we are afraid? Oosterwicht, 2017, sought to understand the kind of morbid curiosity that humans seemingly have towards the negative. Uh, Aiden? That's Oosterwicht. Well, there was an attempt. Anyway, subjects were exposed to images, such as snakes or spiders, that they may find uncomfortable and evoke fear. Subjects were encouraged to respond as they truly felt and attempt to ignore socially desirable answers in their response, and were then shown a thumbnail of two images and were quickly asked to select which image they would like to see full size. Afterward, participants were shown all of the images used in the experiment and were asked to rate their levels of interest, feelings of negativity, intensity, and the complexity of each image. These images fall into four categories, negative social, negative physical, negative nature, and neutral. The negative social category consisted of 30 images displaying social harm, such as war scenes, accidents, or conflicts, things that do damage to society, like Rick and Morty. Where's my sexual sauce? The negative physical category consisted of 30 images displaying decontextualized close-ups of severe bodily harm. Two meatballs. Sorry, I'm childish. The negative nature category consisted of 30 images that displayed close-ups of threatening animals. No, not like that. Animals that are threatening. Hey, Michael, is that you? It's not Michael. Finally, the neutral category consisted of 30 images with no strong positive nor negative connotations, such as household objects, plants, buildings, or people walking down the street. Participants preferred the negative social images over the neutral ones, selected to view the negative physical images as often as the neutral ones, while the negative nature images were chosen less often than the neutral ones. This preliminary study indicates, yes, people are drawn towards violent and disturbing imagery, but mostly as it applies to people rather than animals like snakes or spiders. Thus, people seemingly do have a morbid curiosity towards things that may be horrifying, but more so as it applies to social situations rather than bodily harm, and far more so than it applies to dangerous animals. To further understand this morbid curiosity tendency, in a second study, subjects were exposed to the same four types of images, but this time, some of the images were matched more closely so that they both depicted similar situations and environments, and included positive images instead of just purely negative or neutral ones. So that in turn, half of the negative social images were matched with neutral social images with no emotional connotation, such as people walking down the street, and the other half matched with images with a positive connotation, such as people relaxing on a beach. Once again, subjects preferred to view the negative social images over the true neutral images, although subjects also preferred the positive social images over the negative ones. This time, negative physical images were chosen less often than neutral physical images and positive physical images. In alignment with the pilot study, again, negative animal images were selected less frequently than positive and neutral images of animals. Of the three negative categories, only negative social images depicting things like car crashes or war were preferred over the neutral social images, with positive social images being preferred of the three types of social imagery. This second study, then, was indicative that while we may have a morbid curiosity for the horrifying compared to the mundane, generally speaking, when given the option, we are most drawn towards positive images, not negative ones. Because there were seemingly conflicting findings between the first and second study, a third study removed the possible confound of image complexity that might have driven the selection of one image over another simply because one looked more interesting, replicating the previous experiments but using text instead of thumbnails that just described the image that participants would then get to see. For example, firemen carrying a dead body versus 
a friend carrying another smiling friend. For various reasons, including the fact that it was difficult to come up with complex descriptions of animals, but also I would imagine because the nature images produced the most consistent findings in the first two experiments, this third study excluded nature imagery. As in the second experiment, half of the negative descriptions of pictures were paired against neutral depictions, while the other half were paired against positive depictions. This time, again, subjects opted to see the negative social image more than the neutral social image, but also more than the positive one. In turn, negative physical image descriptions were chosen less often than both positive and neutral physical image descriptions. For the entire experiment, negative image descriptions were generally selected more than neutral ones, but this was not the case for negative versus positive descriptions, only negative versus neutral. Across these three studies then, it seems, yes, we will sometimes be drawn towards images that could disturb us. But perhaps because of evolutionary rationales, that doesn't tend to apply to images of animals that induce fear, once again like snakes or spiders. However, it does include images of human social suffering, and sometimes even human physical suffering. Thus, while we might be more prone to jump in reaction to a stick in the grass that we mistake for a venomous snake as a product of our evolutionary self-defense system, it seems we also do possess a sense of morbid curiosity that sometimes draws us to be motivated by the macabre and seek it out. But is this the case for all people all of the time? And perhaps more importantly, why? If we have evolved to pay attention to things that could frighten us in nature, yet don't intentionally choose to see images of those things when given a choice all the time, is it just morbid curiosity depicting harm befalling our fellow humans that causes us to seek out horror films? What is the value in getting scared of things that can't actually hurt us, but seem to be hurting other people? Researchers and philosophers alike have long suggested that, much as with humor, one thing that sets humans apart from other species is our unique enjoyment of being frightened. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense prima facie to intentionally seek out a scenario that creates negative emotional states. Fear. So why is it that we so often seem to enjoy being scared? Early theories of media psychology were kind of incapable of providing an explanation for the allure of horror, specifically the hedonic principle. The hedonic principle was supported by media scholars in times past, which posits that we consume media in order to feel good, to experience hedonic pleasure. However, this theory quickly fell apart under the slightest scrutiny, as after all, if that were the case, why would humans expose themselves to scenarios that generate negative emotions, such as sad plays or films, and of course, horror? The ancient Greeks proposed that our attraction towards environments that stimulate negative emotions was out of a desire for catharsis, a purging of those negative emotions in a controlled environment. But is there modern evidence for the existence of catharsis? Do we like horror simply so that we can expunge ourselves of feelings of fear? Skeptical of the ancient cathartic hypothesis, many scholars over the last several decades have suggested that our desire for fear, drama, or tragedy is actually a product of evolution. One of those scholars being Dr. Dolph Zillman. Zillman, considered by many to be the father of media psychology research, conducted numerous experiments designed to understand the seemingly paradoxical nature of why we consume media designed to scare us. In his 1980 chapter, The Anatomy of Suspense, Zillman describes a number of theoretical rationale to explain this paradox, first amongst them being his theory of suspense. This theory posits that, when engaging with media, we will hope for positive outcomes for liked actors while hoping for negative outcomes for disliked actors, while in contrast we fear negative outcomes for liked actors and similarly fear positive outcomes for disliked ones. This certainly helps explain horror cinema, wherein the supposed protagonists have engaged in some reprehensible action that seemingly justifies their demise at the hands of a malevolent force. Seen perhaps not as a good actor in general, but good in comparison to the main characters who have behaved immorally. Jason Voorhees and the Friday the 13th series are perhaps the most iconic manifestation of this theory in action, in that while yes, Jason is a ruthless serial killer, his backstory provides context as to not only why he is driven to murder camp counselors, but ultimately frames said counselors as indirectly responsible through their negligence, via their lascivious behavior, which supersedes their concern for campers, for Jason being abandoned, presumed dead. Jason's mother, in a rage, kills the counselors she sees as responsible for her son's death, only to herself be killed by the counselors, which further enrages Jason and stokes his ire against the irresponsible horny co-eds who run Crystal Lake. So while, yes, Jason is a bad actor, so too are the camp counselors that he murders. Thus, we may somewhat root for Jason in that scenario. However, not all horror films are Friday the 13th or Drag Me to Hell or even a subversion of that trend like Cabin in the Woods, wherein the alleged protagonists are arguably more dislikable than the villains. So again, we are left with a paradox. Suspense theory alone cannot seemingly explicate, 
but we'll get more into that later. Not every horror movie has a detestable bunch of protagonists, though. And so why would we expose ourselves to film wherein we like the main characters and are then forced to watch their lives be placed in danger? Zillman proposed another theory, excitation transfer, to help explain this discrepancy by predicting that one emotion, say fear, can transfer onto another one, say joy, after media exposure and that this may help explain why we enjoy seeing protagonists in danger whether we like them or not. Excitation transfer theory predicts that when viewers of some media are excited or aroused, the extent of that arousal may transfer onto other unrelated emotions. As many media pundits and hack ex-lawyers have suggested, for example, playing a violent horror video game may make people more aggressive because of a transfer of fear emotions onto aggressive emotions. Thus, in his seminal, somewhat infamous study published in 1971, and an emphasis on seminal here more than usual, Zillman conducted a pilot study of just 12 male participants who were exposed to six different short films, two neutral films, Marco Polo's Travels, an educational film, and Bannister vs. Landy, a sports documentary. Two films designed to evoke aggression, Body and Soul and The Champion, both films about prize fighters, and two films intended to evoke arousal, erotic films, The Couch and The Street. While watching the film, subjects were connected to an apparatus designed to measure the number of bodily functions, no, not the ones you're probably imagining at the very mention of erotic films, but did include heart rate, skin temperature, blood pressure, and activation of other aspects of the sympathetic nervous system, such as sweating, eye movement, and salivation. Men who watched the erotic films presented with high blood pressure, heart rate, and sympathetic activation, while having a lower temperature and reported less interest in those films. Those exposed to the naughty media, however, also reported more hostility and aggression than those who watched the aggressive, violent film. Now, of course, the obvious problem with this study is that no one is going to enjoy watching porn while being attached to a bunch of machinery and then being monitored by a team of scientists. So, of course, the erotica made these guys angry. No. Are you serious? <laughs> not what it looks right like. Right in front of my salad? Well, maybe not no one likes that. What is up, everyone? A problem that often arises, unlike the guys in that Zillman experiment, and still plagues media psychology, however, is that while we can ask subjects how aggressive media makes them feel, that may not necessarily correlate to real-world aggression. And of course, there is no more preferred method of measuring potential violence in the social sciences during the mid-20th century than the electric shock. Thus, in a second experiment, first male subjects were asked to engage with another supposed participant in a rapport-building game. How were they to build rapport? Why, by shocking each other. Specifically, participants were instructed to shock their partner when he answered questions about a film that they believed the partner had seen, but which subjects had actually not yet been exposed to, incorrectly. Of course, the other participant was really a research assistant and was not receiving any actual shocks because otherwise this would be extremely immoral. Although I'm sure there are a lot of people who wouldn't shy away from an opportunity to cause bodily harm to someone who disagrees with their film opinions. Oh, the slay's rubbish. Anyway, after this initial exposure, subjects were further exposed to one of the three aforementioned film clips and were then returned to the lab with their prior rapport-building partner and asked to relay to them a series of three letters. Dick. When the alleged other subject did not understand the meaning of the letters, the subject was instructed to give them a shock, and this time was allowed to vary the intensity of the shock over 12 trials, wherein the shock dial label ranged from minor discomfort to extremely painful. Those who watched the aggressive film gave more intense shocks than those who watched the neutral film. However, those who watched the erotic film gave the most intense shocks, by far. Additionally, the intensity of shocks increased over time, such that subjects became seemingly more aggressive as they became accustomed to this activity. Compared to erotic material, it seems that violent media is less prone to result in increased aggression compared to neutral media, and excitation transfer may explain that tendency, in that watching something aggressive allows us to externalize that aggression rather than afflict aggression of our own onto others. Although, in general, when you let people shock each other, they become kind of desensitized to the severity of that aggressive act over time, regardless of the stimuli. Thus, while violent media can increase aggression, specifically, the results of these studies can be applied more generally in that violent media can increase excitement, and that excitement can transfer onto other emotions, such as joy at the end of a horror film when a protagonist survives, as a type of catharsis. Despite the fact that many horror films don't have happy endings, hell, some don't have endings at all, they are certainly, well at least usually, exciting. So can excitement alone draw us to what might otherwise be an unpleasant experience that we would not want to subject ourselves to 
when there is no positive narrative resolution at the end. King and Harani 2007 sought to understand how the endings of horror films influence enjoyment, which can give us some better insight into why we watch horror if not for the typical purpose of excitation transfer into more positive emotions via a positive outcome. The researchers selected four films, the original Candyman, Needful Things, Leprechaun, and Pet Cemetery. Some of these things are not like the others, but are similar to each other in that each ends with scenes wherein good prevails over evil. However, some subjects were exposed to a teaser cut of the film that omitted the final scenes and instead ended with a lack of resolution. If you're wondering why the researchers chose this eclectic bunch of films, well, their argument was that they were all relatively older at the time of data collection and thus their sample of predominantly college freshmen were probably unfamiliar with them. Subjects answered questions before and after the screening, including their taste for different types of horror, specifically gore or thrills, as well as their emotional reaction to the film and specifically to the film's ending. Respondents who watched the teaser open ending rated the film as less entertaining, less scary, and more predictable. There was no aggregate difference in responses to the distressing nature of the film, however, those low in appreciation of gore found the teaser ending less distressing, while those who liked gore oddly found the teaser ending more distressing. Low thrill seekers found the teaser ending less distressing than the ending wherein the villain got their just desserts. Generally, subjects reported liking the traditional ending more than they liked the teaser ending, while similarly more reported disliking the teaser than the traditional final scene. When asked if they would want to change the ending, 69% of those who saw the traditional horror finale reported that they did not want to alter it, while 78% of those who watched the teaser ambiguous ending reported wanting to change it. When viewers were asked to further explain why they liked or disliked the endings of these films, the largest percentage, 29% of those who liked the traditional ending, reported that it was unpredictable, followed by 20% who reported finding the ending interesting, and another 20% mentioning specifically that the villain got what he deserved. Of those who said they liked the teaser ending without resolution, the most common reported opinion by 36% of respondents was that it was predictable, followed by 19% who said it was satisfying, and then 12% mentioning that the villain escaped, and another 12% mentioning that the villain would return another day. The main opinion given by those who disliked the traditional justice ending was that it was unrealistic by 36% of respondents, followed by 27% who were disappointed that the legend of the villain would be discontinued. Despite the fact that the main reason given by those who liked the teaser ending was that it was predictable, being predictable was also the most common opinion in those who disliked the teaser ending, present in 42% of respondents, followed by 31% who disliked that the ending was implying a sequel and a continuation of the villain's story, and 23% who disliked that the villain was not destroyed. For those who wanted to change the traditional ending wherein the villain was defeated, the most common rationale at 31% was that respondents wished another character had lived, followed by 25% who believed the villain's legend should continue, and 25% who wished the ending was more realistic. In turn, only three rationales were given for why subjects wanted to change the teaser ending, with the most common, 43% being a desire to see evil be destroyed, followed by 41% who wanted to ensure there was no continuance of the villain's legend, and 16% who wanted the film to be less predictable. The results of these opinion-based questions are seemingly more than a little bit conflicting, in that some people will want to see more of a horror villain when there is a definitive ending to that character in the finale of a horror film, specifically when good prevails over evil. However, when the ending is ambiguous and it appears that the villain may go on to continue their vile ways, viewers dislike the lack of recompense for that character's actions, seemingly wanting both things at the same time. Overall, though, subjects preferred the definitive ending where the villain was destroyed rather than the ending that was more open to interpretation. Thus, while it may be that excitation transfer creates more enjoyment of a film when the perpetrator of whatever violence has occurred in a horror movie is vanquished at the end, people may still find themselves wanting more horror, and that's certainly been the case when we look at some of the world's largest horror franchises that have gone on for decades and gone into double digits of installments. While people want to see Jason or Freddy or Michael Myers lose at the end of a specific film to transfer the excitation generated from that specific film into one of relief or happiness, they still want the option of being able to go back to the theater and see Jason or Freddy or Michael Myers again in another movie later, likely to experience more of that exact excitation and arousal experienced in response to the film that they just watched. So while people may want resolution to an individual horror film, we seemingly want a constant supply of more horror. Well, King and Harani's study gives us more evidence on excitation transfer and enjoyment of horror films, it still doesn't answer the question as to why people might watch horror that doesn't have a happy ending. So why do we? Well, sometimes the best way to figure out why people do something is to just ask them, which Lin and Zhu 2017 did. And yes, if you can believe it, it took social scientists something like 30 years of studying horror cinema 
to just freaking ask people, evidence that the field is apparently full of women. And they did so in a sample of university students in response to horror content on television, such as The Walking Dead, Supernatural, American Horror Story, and other children's programming. Subjects were asked about their viewing habits of these shows and their levels of empathy, general aggression, motives for watching, cognitive and affective involvement in the programs, viewing frequency, and enjoyment. Watching horror television for the purpose of entertainment was positively related to watching shows for the purpose of escapism, passing the time, and relaxation, and those who watched for entertainment were more positive or neutral in the emotions that they felt towards horror shows. As we would expect, watching for entertainment was related to enjoyment and to exposure to these programs. Escapism as a motive was also positively related to all other motives, but unlike entertainment, was also positively related to intent to watch horror for cognitive reasons. That is a desire to think about the show, in addition to emotional responses to the shows, positive, negative, and neutral, and was further positively related to enjoyment but not related to general exposure to the programming. Similarly to entertainment, watching horror for the purpose of passing the time was related to all other motives, but unrelated to watching for cognitive purposes, while being positively related to all three emotional responses, again positive, negative, and neutral, and positively related to enjoyment, but not related to degree of exposure. Relaxation was related to all other motives, but negatively related to a desire for cognition. That is, people who want to relax, don't want to have to think too hard about their horror, women were more likely to report that they were higher in empathy, what a joke, and possessed less positive and neutral reactions to horror television than did men. To get a better idea of how these variables predict one another, regression analysis revealed that only a desire for escapism predicted wanting to watch horror for cognitive reasons. Entertainment, escapism, and to a lesser degree relaxation motives predicted watching horror both to experience positive and negative emotions, while relaxation also predicted neutral emotional reactions. Greater enjoyment of horror television unsurprisingly predicted more exposure to horror television. While empathy did not predict enjoyment, it did predict cognitive involvement. In contrast to empathy, aggressiveness also predicted positive emotional reactions to the shows, but was unrelated to other emotional responses. Gender was negatively related to neutral effective response and to cognitive response directly, but was positively related to empathy and through empathy to cognitive responses to horror television. One big takeaway from this analysis is then, that women can like horror, but only as mediated through feelings of empathy for the characters, and then mostly just as a cognitive exercise, rather than one of pure entertainment, relaxation, or even time-wasting. In general, then, people have different reasons for watching horror, but if you're watching it for one reason, say entertainment, you probably get something else out of it, like relaxation or escapism or, or just time-wasting and maybe cognition too, although not unilaterally. Interestingly, people who watch horror for entertainment, cognition, and escapism experience negative emotions in reaction to horror, and watching for cognition or escapist motives was unrelated to reports of enjoyment, while watching for entertainment was. These results are indicative that there are reasons outside of pure eudaimonia, happiness, or pleasure. These results are indicative that there are reasons outside of pure hedonia, happiness, or pleasure, for which we watch horror, and further evidences that we can be entertained by horror and enjoy it while still feeling negative emotions at the same time. Once again, horror presents as a paradox of media exposure motivations. Perhaps one of the reasons for the paradox of horror is that horror often involves introducing the viewer to new scenarios with which they are wholly unfamiliar. While motives, while movies often place the viewer into a unique and bizarre world, they usually have some core humanistic elements that make the subject feel familiar there. Of course, although there are no real-world superheroes, heroism is something that we can often see in the real world in the selfless actions of extant people, thus we can relate to movies about gods amongst men, like Superman or Thor or Seinfeld, due to the human elements of media and its protagonists. But horror, by its very nature, exposes us to worlds and scenarios that are totally separated from our own, as do superhero films, but in horror, these worlds are not ones we want to live in. We can be fascinated by things that are completely alien to us in two ways then, the awesome and the awful, as often the most terrifying things are those which we cannot understand. The entire genre of Lovecraftian or cosmic horror is based on the feeling of utter insignificance in a universe that is so far beyond our comprehension that to even glimpse a fraction of its mysteries would drive one mad. And as such, Taylor and Uchida, 2019, sought to understand if fear in reaction to horror differed significantly from awe as a type of need for cognitive accommodation. Need for cognitive accommodation, or NFA, is the perception that one cannot assimilate an experience into their existing mental framework and should therefore modify one's understanding of the world to make sense of it. Of course, much like how being scared can be uncomfortable, so too can it be uncomfortable if we need to reevaluate our perception of the world when we are in awe. All kinds of new experiences can induce awe, from spiritual awakenings to learning about the vastness of the universe. So how is awe different from horror? 
In their first study, subjects were asked to think about a time when they either felt horror or awe by responding to the following prompt. Awe, or horror, is an emotion felt towards something vast that you can't fully understand at the time in which, in the awe condition, the sentence continued, you feel someone or something is amazing or sublime, and in the horror condition continued, someone or something was harmed or damaged. Subjects were then asked to think about a time when they felt horror or awe and completed a questionnaire regarding their various cognitive and emotional appraisals of the event. Those thinking about awe reported feeling more personal agency but less general human agency than those thinking about horror, indicating subjects feel they have more personal control when thinking about the vastness of the universe, but that humans in general have less control than they themselves do as an individual. Awe was more strongly correlated to certainty about the world and paying more attention to the world than was horror. Horror, in turn, was associated with perceptions of obstacles in the way of one's goals, as it was anticipation of needing to expand effort in general. Those thinking about awe-inspiring situations were more likely to believe in the legitimacy of the universe, which is a perception that things are fair, than when thinking about horror, and were more likely to see the world as pleasant. Thus, it seems pretty clear that these two variables are quite different, but there are some interesting findings here specifically as it applies to certainty, which was far higher in awe than in horror, indicating that horror is a more difficult emotion to resolve when faced with uncertainty than is awe, both emotions that produce uncertainty. Further, differences in personal agency could indicate that horror causes people to feel small and helpless, while awe does not, necessarily, even though we might logically think they both should. To further understand the relationship between these two variables, a second study was conducted that included the very disparate concept of contentment, as with the first study, subjects were asked to think about a time when they personally experienced awe, horror, or contentment, and describe the scenario that elicited that feeling. Incongruence, that is, the difference between the recalled event and daily life, as well as NFA were measured, the latter by asking subjects how difficult the experience was to assimilate into their perceptions of reality. Awe was evoked most commonly by specific events, nature or a specific person, while horror was evoked most commonly by specific events, information, and death. Descriptions of incongruity with daily life were broken down into two general types, extremity, which focused on the atypical or excessive nature of the event, and spiritual vastness, which focused on the metaphysical perceptions that often violates expectations of the universe. All was the only variable related to spiritual vastness, while in turn, horror was the only variable positively related to extremity. Contentment was negatively related to both extremity and spiritual vastness. Similarly, in relationship to NFA variables, again, feelings that result from experiencing something you cannot fully comprehend, all was positively related to shock, while negatively related to feelings of chaos. Horror was positively related to both shock and chaos, and contentment was negatively related to both shock and chaos. As such, while horror and awe are both emotions that we could relate to a feeling of being lost in the vastness of the universe, they produce very different reactions to that feeling, both of which are unrelated to feelings of contentment. Awe can cause us to feel shocked, but this shock is generally more positive, being related to feelings of spirituality, while instead horror is more negative, being related to both shock and sensations of chaos, as well as the perception that the horror event was unusual and excessive. While awe is not necessarily positive, as contentment is, it's also related to feelings of vastness, but less so than is horror. Perhaps then, one of the reasons we are drawn to horror, even though it is uncomfortable, is because it forces us to face ideas that cause us to question the nature of the universe. While this study specifically asked about real-life experiences, we could apply the findings to horror films as well, and such, people who seek out sensations of awe may also seek out sensations of horror in film, given its relationship to a need for cognitive accommodation. Or at least that might be the case for more abstract Lovecraftian horror, perhaps not a slasher flick, which probably isn't so philosophically complex. So, getting back to the concrete and away from the abstract, while so far we've focused on horror films, horror games have become increasingly popular, both for players of the games like Phasmophobia and viewers of YouTubers, which have gained millions of clicks, playing through games like Amnesia or Five Nights at Freddy's, and engaging in funny screaming. Mm, funny scream, funny scream. <laughs> ah! So to better understand modern enjoyment of horror, we should look briefly at horror games. And to do that, we can look to a study from Lin Wu and Tao 2020 in their analysis of VR horror games. Subjects played a four-minute demo of the game The Brookhaven Experiment on the HTC Vive. This demo lacked any narrative and merely pits players against waves of zombies coming from 360 degrees around him or her, armed with limited ammo and a flashlight with a limited battery supply. Before playing, participants were shown a short introductory video to the game and were walked through a presentation explaining the controls before being given a brief trial introduction to the gameplay and the controls in the VR device, and then playing through the full four-minute demo. And if you're wondering, all of this excessive setup was required because the demo did not contain a journalist mode. 
afterwards, subjects were given a list of eight VR games from various genres that they could choose to play for five more minutes before ending the experiment. Skin-conductive response was measured during gameplay, and reported feelings of enjoyment, fear, and self-efficacy, that is the belief that one is capable of completing one's goals, were all measured. Subjects whose skin-conductive response indicated high arousal and reported low levels of fear enjoyed the game about equally regardless of individual levels of self-efficacy, while those low in efficacy who were also higher in fear enjoyed the game the least. For participants with low levels of skin-conductive arousal, they enjoyed the game the most when they were low in fear and in efficacy, and slightly less when they possessed greater efficacy. Just a reminder, arousal in this case refers to skin-conductive response, not what you would typically associate between the words VR headset and arousal. There was no effect on enjoyment for those low in arousal when they were afraid, regardless of self-efficacy. Thus, people tended to enjoy the game when it scared them only when they were also excited by it and were high in self-efficacy. As such, those less afraid of horror games tend to comparatively enjoy them far more than those who feared them. Similar results were forwarded in relationship to intentions to play a VR horror game in the future. Those who were afraid of the game were only as likely to say they would want to play a similar game in the future when they were excited by that game and also high in self-efficacy. Thus, people who are afraid of horror games need to feel that they are intense, but also feel that they have some capacity to mitigate the feelings of fear by getting good, and as such not only enjoy horror games, but are more likely to play them in the future. After finishing the game and subsequent survey, participant decisions on which game to play next differed based on their experiences with the horror game and individual differences. Those high in self-efficacy most commonly chose the horror game Horde Z, while those low in self-efficacy generally chose to play the relaxing games The Blue and The Rose and I. Subjects who elected to play Horde Z rated their fear in the previous game the lowest, followed by those who chose the other horror option, The Horror Elevator. Which I can't find any gameplay footage of, so let's just pretend it's this. <laughs> Those who chose to play the relaxing game The Blue rated their enjoyment of the previous VR horror game as the lowest amongst the sample, followed by those who chose to play fellow relaxing game The Rose and I, and then the interactive experience Tilt Brush. Those who chose to play Horde Z similarly rated their previous enjoyment as the highest, again followed by those who chose to play the horror elevator. It seems then that people who are drawn towards horror are less afraid of horror, but also get the most enjoyment out of it. While that seems a bit obvious, these findings may help explain who is drawn to horror, those just not really bothered by it, because it's only when they aren't overwhelmingly afraid that they can then actually enjoy that media. To get a broader view at motivations for consuming horror media and try to further understand the paradoxes involved, we can look to Hoffner and Levine, 2005, who conducted a meta-analysis on the admittedly limited study of horror in the field of psychology. If you haven't noticed up to this point, I'm not citing studies here that are exactly cutting edge in terms of year of publication, and that's really because there isn't a ton of interest in studying horror compared to many other topics, even just within the field of media psychology. And while I can't really tell you why that's the case, a meta-analysis can still help us get a better idea of what the research that has been conducted seems to indicate in relationship to why people watch horror. Thus, Hoffner and Levine examined 35 published journal studies conducted on horror and violent media that also assessed enjoyment, published since the 1980s. Their analysis revealed that arousal, empathy, and aggression, as well as participant age and sex, were all predictors of enjoying horror films. Negative emotions were significantly stronger in relationship to enjoyment for male viewers than for female viewers, but these negative feelings did not predict enjoyment in both sexes. Arousal alone did not predict enjoyment for either sex, which is at odds with Zillman's excitation transfer theory, but empathy was. Specifically, empathy and personal distress both negatively predicted enjoyment of horror films. Both sensation-seeking and aggressiveness were positively related to enjoyment. As we've seen in individual studies, being female was negative. Why do you come uh, negatively related to enjoyment of horror, violence, and blood or gore, particularly to excessive blood and gore. Age presented with a curvilinear relationship. That is, children generally do not enjoy horror films, and that enjoyment increases into adolescence and then decreases in older participants. This could be because the very young and the very old have lower levels of feelings of efficacy in their capacity to protect themselves or others from danger, which could also explain why most women are less interested in horror. As such, we have a pretty good idea of why people tend to be attracted to horror emotionally and evolutionarily. They're seeking out exciting sensations, often in hopes of a happy ending against which they can turn that excitement into positive emotions. Even though horror evokes negative emotions, it can also entertain, induce cognitions, and even relax. 
but not in all people all of the time. One specific finding that seems pretty consistent across a lot of the research that we've already looked at is that of the differences that separates horror fans from horror haters is largely sex. Men just seem a little bit more fond of horror than our women. So why would it be the case, and why would horror films have so long drawn couples to movie theaters to engage in some mutual misery? Early on in the history of the study of horror, scholars started to notice that men and women tend to have very different responses towards it, and drives to watch it. For example, De Weird, Zillman, and Ordman 1994 sought to understand how distressful media outside specifically of horror can influence emotions to better understand if it's possible exposure to a scary or a sad film can transfer into more positive emotions, and ended up finding a unique effect of gender. In this experiment, being conducted in the 90s and not the social science wild west of the early 70s wherein studies really only involved males, both male and female participants were invited to a screening of a shortened version of the drama film Steel Magnolias, which was paused three times during the showing to question subjects on their emotions while watching the film, and then again after its completion, such as why would anyone watch Steel Magnolias? Steel Magnolias follows the life of a young woman named Shelby who suffers from diabetes. Hold up, is f***ing diabetes damaged over time? <laughs> oh, no. The film was first paused 17 minutes into the runtime after Shelby suffers from a diabetic seizure, 37 minutes into the film after Shelby becomes pregnant, which serves as a serious threat to her health, and finally 66 minutes in after Shelby passes away, having given birth to a son. In addition to enjoyment, reports of heart racing, physical discomfort, and crying were assessed at these three points, and participants' trait empathy was measured after the end of the film. As one might expect, women expressed more symptoms of emotionality, such as crying or getting a lump in her throat, than did men, and this was the case regardless of individual differences in trait emotional sensitivity. The same was the case for degree of sad emotional arousal, which was higher in women, again regardless of trait disparity. Similarly, women reported enjoying the film more than men, and specifically so when they were high in empathetic sensitivity. In other words, people who found the film to be most emotionally distressing also tended to like that film the most. And in the case of depressing films, that mostly applies to women. So what about horror? Do men and women respond to horror differently? And if so, why? Well, nothing is more primal to the evolution and survival of any species than is sex and reproduction. And thus, Zillman et al. 1986 suggested that how functions like excitation present in viewers of horror may be related to evolutionary psychology when it specifically concerns interaction between the sexes. In this study, men and women participants were assigned to watch clips from several horror movies with a partner of the opposite sex, actually a research confederate. First, subjects completed a questionnaire regarding their preference for and familiarity with various contemporary horror films. Polygraph-like equipment was attached to both confederates and to subjects to create the perception that the researchers were really just interested in studying arousal and not in the gender interaction. Participants and their research assistant counterpart then watched a scene from the film Nightmares or from Friday the 13th Part 3. Confederates were given specific instructions on how to behave during the screening, with some expressing emotional mastery of their fears, others expressing indifference, and some expressing distress. Indifference presented as boredom, distress as jerking around in one's chair, and exclaiming, oh my god, so basically this. <laughs> while mastery presented as casual posture and verbal encouragement of the protagonists. Afterwards, the dyad was placed in front of two separate screens, facing back to back, and were shown various images of people, asked to guess the age of the person depicted. After answering, they were allowed to discuss their answers with one another. The Confederate gave obviously correct answers half of the time and obviously incorrect answers half of the time at random intervals. And when I say the answers are obvious, it's because these are pictures of real people and not anime characters. This part of the procedure was designed to give subjects a reason to doubt the accuracy or normalcy of the perceptions of their partner. Emotional responses towards the film, feelings towards the film companion, and willingness to agree with the Confederate's age ratings were then assessed, and the results are pretty illuminating. Women were the most distressed by the horror film segments when their male partner expressed mastery, but also enjoyed the films the most when in the presence of men who were unperturbed by the film, yet seemed invested in it. Women reported the most delight when their male partner was indifferent and seemingly bored by the stimuli. Further, women were by far the least delighted by the clips and felt the lowest enjoyment when their male counterpart displayed overt signs of emotional distress. 
In opposition, men were the most distressed by the film when their female counterparts also expressed distress, but were also more delighted by the film and enjoyed it more when the woman watching alongside them seemed to be afraid of the film. In opposition, men were the least distressed, least delighted, and found the film least enjoyable when their female compatriot expressed mastery in response to the horror segment. Women rated men as more physically attractive and possessed of more positive traits, despite not otherwise finding them to be as attractive of a companion when the male partner expressed mastery in reaction to the film clip. In turn, men who otherwise rated their female companions less favorably reported finding the women in this study more attractive when she was distressed or indifferent towards the clip, compared to when she expressed mastery. In regards to the image rating task, women were less likely to argue with the reported age suggested by her male counterpart when he had previously expressed mastery in reaction to the film. In other words, when she thought the guy was hot because he acted bravely, she didn't tend to argue with him. Men always acquiesced more to a woman he found attractive, regardless of how she reacted to the film, See? <laughs> but were most likely to argue with her when she was seen as lower in attractiveness and expressed mastery. In summation then, a woman is generally more likely to enjoy horror when she watched it with a man who was brave or indifferent towards the content, while men are the antithesis and dislike horror the most when watching with a woman who is kinda into that thing. Moreover, women found men who were resolute in their response to horror more physically attractive and were less likely to argue with him. Zillman thus proposed an evolutionary rationale for these findings, in that perhaps one of the reasons we watch horror, at least with the opposite sex, is to engage in performative gender roles wherein men can act strong in the face of something designed to scare them, while women can act afraid and thus engage in the classic leaping into the arms kind of behavior so common in tropes of men and women watching horror films together. There are ghost cars all over these highways, you know. Hold me. Only if you hold me. <laughs> Sparks 1991 sought to further understand this relationship between gender roles and horror across two studies. In his first experiment, men and women subjects, isolate from one another, watched a segment from the film When a Stranger Calls, and their levels of distress and delight were measured after exposure. Men reported being less distressed and more delighted with the clip than did women. So not only does it seem that men can impress women by expressing mastery in front of them while watching a horror film, men are just more likely to enjoy horror in general than are women. The question is then, if women don't like horror as much as men, why would they watch it? And the answer is likely, at least in part, the same, to cuddle up with a cute guy that she likes. But to get a better idea, Sparks conducted a second study. In his subsequent experiment, Sparks predicted that physiological arousal, excitation, would be related to greater enjoyment and delight in men, but not in women. This time, before watching the film, sensors were attached to participants' fingers designed to measure skin conductive response. Men and women, once again alone, then watched a short segment from Nightmare on Elm Street Part 1 and were asked about their levels of distress and enjoyment after exposure. Once again, men were less distressed by the films and enjoyed them more than did women. Moreover, distress was related to delight in men, but not in women. In terms of skin conductive response, the levels obtained from female subjects were significantly higher than in men, but increased skin conductivity was positively related to enjoyment of the film in both sexes. These studies would indicate then that women absolutely can like horror in a vacuum, but tend to be less likely to enjoy it compared to men, and that instead, while both sexes can get more enjoyment out of horror when watching it with a member of the opposite sex behaving in a way that aligns with traditional gender roles, likely as a function of evolutionary psychology, men will just generally be more likely to watch horror films than will be women. Although increased skin conductive response, that is excitation, is positively related to enjoyment of media regardless of sex. So while it seems that men may be more likely to enjoy horror in general than are women, there are female outliers, much like myself, who enjoy horror. So what other characteristics could help predict or explain who likes horror outside of biological sex? To get an idea of who goes to see horror films outside of the lab, Tambourini and Stiff, 1986, interviewed subjects exiting the theater after watching Halloween 2. What a shame. If only they had held out for three, maybe they would have gotten different responses. In the open-ended portion of the questionnaire, interviewees gave five reasons for watching horror films. Because they are exciting, because they are scary, because of the destruction or power within them, because the good guy wins, and because they were funny. Respondents then answered questions about their desire for sensation-seeking, which again is a trait related to enjoyment of new or unique sensations, their general like for fright, which included questions about horror film attendance, liking of and enjoyment specifically of horror films, as well as perceived importance that the hero succeeds at the end of a story. Men were more likely to report enjoying the destructive aspects of horror and tended to be more likely to be higher in sensation-seeking. 
younger people were also higher in sensation-seeking. Interestingly, sensation-seeking was negatively related to enjoyment of feeling afraid, as was seeking out a just ending. Women were more likely to report wanting to see a just ending wherein the heroes prevail as their main reason for watching horror, which might contribute to the reason women don't tend to enjoy a lot of horror, since so many horror films involve a lot of protagonists not making it to the end. Watching more movies and liking of fright were both positively correlated with frequency of watching horror films, which in turn positively correlated to going to see Halloween 2 in theaters. In their final model, these variables accounted for 23% of variance in liking frightening films and 25% of variance in frequency of watching horror films. Therefore, outside of a desire to engage in a pseudo-sexual ritual with a potential male counterpart, women may also be more likely to enjoy horror films when the hero wins, while that does not tend to be a predictor for male enjoyment of horror. Further speaking on differences between the sexes and their favorability towards the frightening, given that so much horror often crosses the line with more erotic cinema, with women often being the targets of some creature of the night or villain, hunting her while she is dressed in her evening lingerie, that is, in the film, not in some executive's hotel room. Anyway, Oliver 1994 examined how men and women responded to horror films based on the sexual nature of the film and the gender of the victim. Subjects answered several questions about their attitudes towards several social and media variables, Afterwards, they were attached to a device used to measure skin conductive response, and then watched a six-minute documentary about visual perception, and then a ten-minute edited scene from the film Hide and Go Shriek, which features a bunch of horny teenagers breaking into a furniture store to get drunk and party before deciding to play a game of Hide and Go Seek. The clip was edited in various ways so that it either depicted a sexual or non-sexual scene, and featured either a male or a female victim. In the sexual version, the characters made out while hiding, with implied a uh, spicier behavior to follow. Well, in the non-sexual condition, the teens just hid behind furniture. After watching the hide-and-go-seek section, the next scene depicted one of the characters, either male or female, being separated from the group and then being violently murdered in various ways by a masked but presumably male killer. Men generally reported liking horror more, having seen more horror, and having been more fond of the horror film that they had just seen than were women. But there were some differences. Specifically, men enjoyed the film more when they saw the sexualized game scene than the non-sexualized scene, while women enjoyed both scenes about equally. In terms of skin conductive arousal over the course of the film, subjects were more aroused while watching the hide-and-seek game that was sexualized than the non-sexualized version, and this arousal continued as the film did, with those who watched the sexual scene having higher skin conductive response at the midpoint when the characters were separated from one another. However, the death scene produced similar levels of reactivity in both those who saw the sexy hide-and-go-seek game or the non-sexy game. When it came to fright, women reported being more afraid of the clip than did men. Men were more afraid when they had been exposed to the sexualized scene, while women were more afraid when not exposed to the sexualized scene. So again, it seems that men just tend to like horror more than women, but also sexuality plays a role. While the enjoyment that a lot of women seem to get out of horror is being able to watch it with a man, not so much for the film itself than for the man's performance of resilience towards terror, men are a little bit different. Men enjoy a horror film more when it has sexualized content, but are also more frightened by it. Evolutionary psychology may help provide a context to this finding, in that when men are feeling sexually aroused, they are also likely going to be more concerned about protecting a potential mate from danger so that they can, you know, bring that arousal to fruition. And thus, men are frightened when they see women in dangerous scenarios, specifically when they have been primed to think about sex. In contrast, it could be the case that women are less afraid when they have been exposed to sexual imagery for the exact same reason that men are more frightened, knowing that the man is more aroused and more anxious by the scenario and that he'll leap to her defense to protect Milady. Once again, the results of this study illustrate how horror movies activate some very basic aspects of our psyche. But what other differences besides sex may predict who likes horror? For answers, we can look to Hoffner 2009, who predicted that empathy and general negative feelings, such as pervasive fear, would be potent variables in influencing who tends to be more drawn towards horror films. Subjects empathetic concern for others, distress during uneasy situations, enjoyment of horror media based on four subtypes of enjoyment, suffering, Why are we still here? danger, excitement, and presence of happy endings, general enjoyment of frightening films, enduring negative affect from exposure to a horror film, and general exposure to horror films were all measured. Those higher in empathy disliked horror that focused on the suffering of others. However, that was where the distaste ended. Empathy was instead positively correlated to enjoyment of danger, excitement, and happy endings in horror cinema. Further, personal distress as a function of fear was unrelated to enjoyment. Suffering in films was positively related to enjoyment of scary content and negatively related to enduring negative affect. 
Somewhat similarly, perceived danger was positively related to enjoyment, but negatively related to exposure to frightening cinema. Happy endings were actually negatively related to enjoyment of horror films, and were negatively related to past exposure to scary media. So while it may be that the reason women, for example, do tend to enjoy horror is for the excitation transfer of a positive outcome, anticipation of that outcome is negatively associated with familiarity with horror as a genre. Empathetic people, as women do tend to be higher in empathy, tend to be less attracted to horror that focuses on suffering but enjoy horror that ends with a positive outcome. However, those who are familiar with horror likely probably know that positive outcomes are often unlikely, or at least that the whole crew likely isn't going to make it to the end. Thus, there is perhaps a unique cycle of horror enjoyment. Women are only willing to watch horror when they believe there's a potential for a happy ending, but if they've seen a lot of horror films, know that that's unlikely, and thus are less drawn towards those films, except when they watch them together with a man who has likely seen more horror and is more adapted to it, by which he displays his mastery of the element and increases both female attraction and her enjoyment of the film as well. It seems then that sex plays an important role in enjoyment of horror from an evolutionary perspective, as it allows men to display their resilience to a frightening situation, which attracts women who are present for such a display. In his 1994 book, The Behavioral Expressions and Biosocial Basis of Sensation Seeking, Zuckerman writes of the evolutionary psychological basis for horror that, quote, a successful hunter must take some risks and even enjoy predation. Because of the risks, a moderate but not too high level of sensation seeking was probably optimal for survival, reproduction, and ensuring the survival of one's offspring. And much in the same way, a man who displays a lack of emotional response during a scary situation would be seen similarly as attractive from a survival perspective as a male hunter would have in our ancestral societies. Horror, then, is a modern display of very ancient human social psychology, the crux of which, as is so many aspects of life, is based predominantly around attracting a mate. And now, as Festivus rolls on, we come to the feats of strength. Not the feats of strength. Thus, when men and women watch horror movies together, the point isn't necessarily to actually enjoy the film. Of course it can be, but it can also be a modern mating display. Although women may be less likely to enjoy horror than our men, they can enjoy it as a social function wherein men display their high value through their resilience and stalwartness in the face of fear. So, understanding everything that we do now about the evolutionary and entertainment reasons for which we enjoy horror, let's come to a few conclusions. Today, we looked at the various reasons why we tend to enjoy horror, even though on its face the very idea of enjoying something designed to upset us is paradoxical. Animals have a need to avoid danger for the survival of the species and evolve to be able to easily detect it. Thus, things that are dangerous or frightening are also things that tend to garner our attention, whether that danger is real or perceived. Coming across some gruesome scene while flipping through the channels may instantly cause us to stop and gaze at something unpleasant due to our inherent tendency to seek out things that could pose a threat to our well-being, even if it's just a representation of such a threat. Although fear is a negative emotion, likely due in part to the attention-grabbing nature of scary things, entertainment that evokes fear can still be an enjoyable experience, both because it excites us and because we may be able to transfer those negative stressful emotions onto more positive ones of relief and jubilation when the scene ends in triumph over evil. Even when it doesn't end on a high note, horror, similarly but distinctly from a sense of awe, can have a lasting effect, and as such people may have reasons outside of pure enjoyment in seeking out the scary, such as finding horror thought-provoking. Not all people enjoy horror equally, however, and there particularly seems to be a statistical difference across the sexes in intentions to expose oneself to a scary situation. Despite the fact that women are less likely to enjoy horror media than are men, both male and female can enjoy the experience of watching horror in each other's company, as seeing a man behave bravely in the face of threat is seen as pretty sexy by a lot of ladies. As such, despite the fact that we should have every reason to avoid horror, we continually find ourselves drawn to it, be it out of morbid curiosity, a desire to be excited, a craving for moral victory over that which scares us, or just because we want to get laid. Horror persists and thrives in every genre of media because it speaks to us both on very basic and complex levels. Enjoyment of horror isn't really the paradox that it seems to be then, but instead a reflection of some of the deepest aspects of human nature, and it will continue to enthrall us in novel ways as it once did our ancestors gathered around the fire. Enjoyment of horror is innately human. But hey, what do you guys think? Have you ever found yourself being drawn to watch something you know will scare you and make you feel uneasy, unable to look away? 
Do you want scary stories to end in victory over the villain, or do you enjoy a dark ending? And if so, what do you think you get out of that dark ending? Ever watch a horror movie with a member of the opposite sex and pull one of these classic maneuvers? Let me know in the comments down below, and while you're down there, check out my sponsor, The Morning Brew. If you've enjoyed this video, please remember to haunt the like button and subscribe if you're not subscribed. As always, an enormous thank you so much to all of my wonderful supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar. You guys and ghouls are amazing, and you allow me to make passion products Products like this that aren't specifically related to any particularly relevant socio-political topics. If you want to see your name listed here on the screen with these fine folks, links to support are down below in the description, as well as to my merch store. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, dear friends, Altana Volt.